Dr. Kenneth here is discussing butt implant surgery today. Buttock implants have become more popular over time due to any number of reasons, societally driven or otherwise. By far the most popular butt augmentation procedure is the fat transfer procedure, the Brazilian butt lifter BBL. Uh, butt implant surgery is much, much lower as far as the number of butt implants placed versus the number of BBLs performed. Uh, and as such, as you might imagine, there are, there are fewer number of physicians, surgeons, placing the butt implants. Now, I do think it's important that the surgeon be a plastic surgeon, board certified plastic surgeon, that's, that's good as well. The key though is to have the training in the plastic surgery to be able to evaluate the patient, determine what's most appropriate, and understand all of the anatomical concerns. So I think that part's important. Then when you're trying to determine how to select a butt implant surgeon, there are all kinds of things you can look at. I mean, you can look at before and after pictures, you can look at videos, you can look at reviews, things of that nature. Basically what you have to decide is, it's the same thing I say all the time, decide who has the highest probability of giving you a successful result. And you just go with that. And there's a certain intrinsic amount of faith and trust in involved in that. And certainly you can have complications. I mean, butt implant surgery is not like breast implant surgery and don't ever get those things confused. Butt implant surgery has a greater number of complications, okay? And I always tell patients the same thing. Look, it's, it, it's, it's not the same as a breast augmentation. I mean, you can do a thousand breast augmentations and not have a complication and do one butt implant surgery and have one complication. The butt implant surgery just has greater problems healing, okay, for the, the individuals. And individuals who want the butt implant surgery usually want larger implants than what is appropriate for their anatomy. So that leads to higher rate of fluid collection, higher rate of incision opening, higher rate uh, of having the implants removed. And so I try to give patients what I feel is a reasonable size for them, but they inevitably want to go higher than that. And, you know, I can technically place these larger implants, but the question is, will the patient heal? And only God knows the answer to that. And it becomes frustrating because you educate the patient to the nth degree, and then they still pick something that you think is, is not the best idea for them, but you have to realize that it's frequently a compromise. And, and so when you're compromising with patients, typically it's not exactly what you want, it's not exactly what they want, although sometimes they get exactly what they want. Now, butt implant surgery, you know, there are all different ways to place the butt implants. There are different types of implants and different textures and shapes, and et cetera, and of course, different volumes. So I'll break this down and make this simple for butt implant surgery. Basically, there are two real, you know, essential placements for the butt implants, okay? Planes of dissection. One is above the muscle, and some people call subfascial. Subfascial, fascia is just the covering of the muscle, so there's not a lot of coverage of the muscle. It's essentially like being under the skin and the fat. And so you can probably get away with that in certain people who have a large amount of subcutaneous fat. However, most of my patients who want the surgery are in fact thinner patients who have very little subcutaneous fat. So two of the main drawbacks of this uh, is, uh, you know, are uh, the, you're going to have to envision this in your head so you kind of see this, but if you have an implant and it's not covered by any amount of tissue, it's going to look alien or stuck on, okay? And so there's not going to be that level of camouflage, particularly in thinner patients. And so the intramuscular pocket is more effective in that regard. The intramuscular pocket also kind of stabilizes the implant, prevents shifting, and I think long term it helps, you know, create a more stable environment in which that implant can kind of uh, be one with the surrounding tissue. If it's above the muscle, the muscle and the contractions and the things of that nature, I think, can predispose it to implant shifting, tissue thinning, etc. So you have to consider all those things when you're placing the butt implants. So I use an intramuscular pocket. What does that actually mean? It's not under the muscle. You don't want to put it under the muscle. Then you're going to have it on the sciatic nerve and other structures that you don't and, and it's going to be painful, plus you're going to be limited by the size of the implant. So what you do is you dissect an intramuscular pocket. I typically dissect about two centimeter muscle flap above, and then I leave the rest of the muscle below. The gluteus maximus muscle is a huge muscle. It's the biggest muscle in most people's body. It's the thickest. Frequently, there are four centimeters at least, even on the thinner patients, and that, hence the two centimeter cuff that I'm talking about above. That still leaves more than two centimeters for coverage of sciatic nerve and deeper structures. And so then you have to realize that, okay, you're going to create a pocket. Well, that's great, but you know how big is the pocket and how big 
of an implant can you possibly place? Now, that's where it gets a little more difficult, okay? People think and they look at themselves in the mirror and they say, well, I'm this wide or I'm that wide, and so therefore I can get the butt implant in. That's just, first of all, the butt implant isn't placed right near the crack of the buttock, okay? It's separated and there's a sacrum and then there's some uh, attachments there and then the muscle. And then so you there, there's a space there from the midline of at least that much before you can start placing the implant. Then people think that, you know, that the gluteus maximus muscle extends all the way far laterally to wherever their skin ends, and that's not the case either. And so the actual width of the gluteus maximus muscle is much smaller than people think. So when you're talking about having submuscular coverage or a muscular coverage or an intramuscular pocket, you have to realize that. So I, when I'm telling patients, hey, this is the biggest intramuscular pocket I can create, otherwise you're gonna have chances of it, you know, seeing the implant, feeling the implant, that type of thing. And you know, I, I sometimes wonder if people are hearing me on that or if they're understanding. They voice their understanding, but then they proceed to ask for bigger and bigger implants. So you have to realize that that's a part of it is, you know, you're protecting against that. And even though most of the revisions I do have to do with the pocket not being dissected appropriately, okay, and then I'm having to fix that, there's no question that you can execute a perfect surgery and still have problems, okay? And I'll talk about that later with complications of butt implants. So the other aspect of placing intramuscular uh, butt implants is the gluteus maximus muscle does not descend all the way to the inferior aspect of the gluteal fold, okay? The gluteal fold is just the fold underneath the buttock, okay? That skin is, you're not going to be dissecting all the way down there to capture that skin. So anyone who has loose skin down there, it's not going to be captured by a butt implant. I always tell people, particularly those who have loose skin or sagging skin, that's not going to be, uh, you know, remedied by that. So you have to realize that that's another factor in evaluating patient's anatomy and another factor in dissection. Furthermore, you don't want to dissect, a, you need to leave an inferior sling of muscle of the gluteus maximus at the bottom to prevent the implant from descending or falling on the skin envelope or making it totic or dragging over time. So that's another aspect of the dissection, technical aspect that some people, you know, don't, don't acknowledge or, or, or don't seem to realize, okay? Finally, that kind of describes kind of how I dissect the pocket, okay, and concerns there. I think the most common things that I see as far as dissection of the pocket being off will be violation of the lateral border of the gluteus and then having the implant being visible, uh, dissecting the implant too far superiorly and having the implant stay up too high on the buttock. Um, there are other reasons that you do revision surgeries like the implant isn't large enough. That's another common reason I do the revision. Sometimes the person had previous complications, the implant needed to be removed, the incisions don't look as good as they could, there are multiple scars from where the incision tried to come through the skin, um, there are deformities from having taken the implant out or previous infections. So there are lots of different deformities that you can get from these surgeries and I see them all the time. And so. Patients need to be aware of that. The goal is to do it right the first time. Follow instructions, follow the post-op, adhere to you know whatever advice I'm giving you so that hopefully the percentage is as high as possible. Now, when you're picking an implant, it could be round or oval or ovoid. There's not a whole lot of difference. I mean, it's pretty simple, the, the picking of the implant. You have to realize that the long axis for a buttock implant, if you're picking an oval, okay, is going, you know, top to bottom, it's a vertical, okay? And then the, the aspect, the shorter axis, is the part that's, you know, going out towards the hip. So if you're picking an oval or an ovoid or anything that has an elliptical shape or somewhat elliptical shape that isn't a round implant in which the diameter is the same throughout, obviously, then you're going to end up with a an implant that's kind of wasting volume at the top and the bottom and also isn't producing hips. So a round implant, placed correctly can always give you a little bit more hip. It won't go all the way around to the anterior portion and sometimes you need the fat grafting for that, but it is a much better option than the ovoid implant. Now, having said that, do I have a problem placing oval or ovoid implants? Absolutely not, that's fine. If a patient thinks that that'll give them a better appearance in spite of my better, I don't have a problem placing that, okay? Because that's an aesthetic issue. In fact, the oval are easier to place because I don't have to dissect the lateral border of the gluteus as much. And so that's what requires the skill is as you get out closer to the lateral border of the gluteus, you almost have to dive down like this. You have to change your plane of dissection. Otherwise you violate the gluteus. So those are the two types of implants. Now implants can be textured or smooth. I typically use only smooth. Now, you know, whether or not that's right, hard to say because of the breast implant data and the textured. I think that one day that will be pinned down. But as of right now, I really don't place any more textured gluteal implants. And as such, I use a company called Implant Tech almost exclusively. Uh, their implants, I think, are of high quality and they have a lot of smooth implants, including larger smooth implants. Um, 
so that takes care of kind of the dissection, re rationale for dissection, anatomic concerns, uh, round versus oval implants. Then you've got to determine what's the volume, okay? And that's always what it comes down to. A lot of these other things are kind of skirted and you don't really discuss them as much because they become rather esoteric. But the, the, the volume of the implant is always what the patient wants to talk about. Now, once again, the round implant, okay, when you're talking about it, the diameter is the concern. So you're talking about two factors, the projection of the implant, how far the buttock sticks out, okay, how far, how, how much improvement in projection are you going to get, and then the diameter. And those implants vary in diameter and projection. So it's not always just about volume. For instance, you know, certain implants will give you about a two uh, inch increase in projection, but may still fit the borders of the gluteus and may not violate that lateral expanse, okay? So that's something to consider. Now, in the literature, we know that 350 cc's and below implants have lower rates of fluid collection, problems, incisions opening, having to remove the implants, implant volumes higher than 350 tend to, tend to have greater complications. And so what are those complications? Fluid collection, incision opening, you know, revisional surgery, having to remove the implants, put them back in later. Uh, removing them for good, and then when you remove them, you may have some deformity depending upon how long they've been and the size of the implant. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And so having said that, do I ever place implants below 350? I can probably count on one hand the number I place uh, below that amount. And they were usually on extremely small people or extremely short people or both. And so, you know, what are we dealing with most of the time? Most of the time I'm dealing with patients who want at least 400 cc's to the max of 715. And with the, the preponderance of those people wanting something closer to the 715, you know, at least 600, if not 715. And the truth of the matter is that's just not a great idea. And I try to relay that to the patient because it doesn't matter if it looks good on the table. I mean, it does because that's important. You want to find the surgeon who gets the best, you know, look on the table. But after that, there's not a lot of surgeon can do. The surgeon gets an A plus on the table if it looks great, it's dissected well, et cetera. But the, the healing, the follow-up, you know, what, what all the patient's doing in the follow-up, whether or not they're uh, adhering to the post-op regimen, whether or not they happen to form a very exuberant foreign body response, whether or not they heal their uh, fluid collection uh, amount, etc. It, it's hard to know all of those things, but you do know that increasing the volume will increase the rate of complications. And so it, it, there's always a discussion about that. And people will say, well, can I sign a release for that? And I go, sure, you can sign a release, but why don't you just go ahead and go with what I'm telling you? The other thing is, is that sometimes I tell people, why don't you place a more conservative implant? And when the tissues stretch and whatnot and the capsules form, there's less risk for fluid collection. You can always place a larger implant. And, you know, but that typically falls on deaf ears as well because they, they want to be one and done. Okay. So I think if it's something you really want and you want to play the statistical game here, okay, which... You should. I, I don't want to belittle it by saying again. You, if you're looking at statistical advantages, you place a smaller implant, wait for the tissue expansion, expansion properties to take place over about a year, and then place a larger implant. You can get away with a lot more that way with fewer uh, complications, okay? I realize most people don't want to pay for the two buttock implant surgery, so cost is an issue as well as recovery time, as well as the time spent during the tissue expansion process. So, all of those things are factors, and I understand that. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to prevent people from having complications and getting them to, to the goal that they want. And so some of that requires a little bit of give and take, and it requires trust. And I just don't, I think a lot of times patients have a distrust or something of that nature, or they just want what they want, irrespective of what makes sense, what's rational, et cetera. And so some of those patients, I do just tell them if I think that they're you know, for instance, let's say you've got a very, very tiny person who wants 715 cc implants. I think that I, I, I'm going to tell them I can't do it. Now, the problem is I've done so many butt implants that I know pretty much exactly what I can place in a person without, you know, what I can technically place in the pocket so that the incision can be closed and there's not tension on the incision. And so a lot of these thinner patients, I can get anywhere from about 490 to 600, even if someone else says, that's oh, just not, not, won't make any sense, okay? But I, I know pretty much exactly what I can fit in there diameter-wise. And so that becomes an issue of just because I can do it, should I do it? So I try to start at the lower end of the range for patients, try to negotiate with them, uh, may emphasize the complications with the higher volumes and whatnot. 
and make them try to get them to realize it's not just about what I can place. It's a question of will they heal? Okay, that's very, very important. Um, so, you know, as it's been about 15 minutes in this little uh, instructional video on butt implants, I think we'll take a break mercifully.